Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for clicking on the video as always. We're back out in my local forest near to Loch Ness. And as you can see, we've had a, a wee dusting of snow. It's been a depressingly mild winter again up here. And the last, I don't know, two and a half weeks, yeah, it's just been mild and damp. Maybe getting a bit chilly and damp, but nothing really resembling winter. We had nothing here yesterday. This was just kind of overnight. And this morning, just a kind of heavy dump of wet snow, but it's, as you can see, it's already melting. And it's actually pretty miserable because it's almost just like it's raining. You can see already I'm getting pretty soaked just from the, the snow dropping off the trees. It's a nightmare for filming as well, but the way the weather's been, I'll, I'll take it. But I, I would be surprised if um, this snow is still here by the time I go to bed tonight, to be honest. But anyway, we are trying something a little different this week. I saw a video on another channel called Survival Land. There's a channel on YouTube that I, I watch quite regularly. A few of you might watch it already. Um, it's a guy doing camping and bushcraft and these kind of things uh, in Slovakia, I think he is, Croatia or Slovakia. And um, he basically set up a tarp shelter, just a plow point, but he had um, a large rock in front of him and he lit a fire in front of that, so that was like the, the fire reflector. And I quite like that idea and this, this local forest is quite rocky and I just wanted to give it a go. I've, I've found a potential spot, I think. It's not ideal, not as ideal as his was, but I'll, I'll try and make it work. Um, there's not a huge amount of space and the ground's not overly flat in front of the rock, but I think, I think we, can make, we can make do. I've also got a, a new grill to try out, a foldable grill. It was sent over to me by Bitty Big Q. Again, a few of you might already recognize the name. There's a few YouTube channels where I've seen people using them. They're getting quite popular and I quite like the look of them. So I was quite happy when they reached out and, and sent me one. So I'll try that. And as always, I've got some nice food to, to cook up. And uh, yeah, we'll see how we get on. But anyway, if that interests you, stick around and we'll get on and set up the tarp shelter. And I hope you enjoy the video. So the plan is, this rock is going to be in front of the shelter. We have the plow point uh, running out that way. I'm going to try tying off to the spruce on top of the rock. Like I say, it's not it's not the ideal setup compared to his video, but I think I think there's enough room to make it work.
Right, so I've just, uh, I've cleared the top layer of vegetation and there's a little skim of kind of peaty soil but underneath it's just like this kind of sort of sandy mineral soil uh, and then there's just solid rock underneath so it'll be more than safe for, for a fire and then tomorrow I'll put the fire out properly put all the soil and vegetation back on and you won't really know I was here Right, so I'm just uh, going to cut a bit of firewood and I just wanted to explain a little bit about where I am and what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a mixed commercial forest and if you've seen me here before, you'll have heard me explain it a little bit. Um, there's a lot of Scots pine in here and it's mixed in with non-native spruce as well, which is the bit we're in here now. And essentially, uh, Scots pine prefers the drier knolls, so in the rocky sections over here, out, oh, out on the other side of the snow, you know, a lot of pine, and then in the kind of dips where you've got uh, more water, more moisture, the spruce does a lot better. But uh, you can have too much water, and if you see here, you know, these, some of these trees are actually sitting in standing water and uh, yeah, that's too much. So you end up uh, with a lot of smaller sticks in here that have just either died because um, they've drowned essentially, too much water, waterlogged, or the other spruce around them who are maybe on slightly drier uh, bits of ground have been able to grow up and now they're overshadowing these these smaller trees So there's quite a lot of Kind of small diameter uh, Dead dry spruce in here, and that's what I'll use for firewood, but they're uh, It's not going to affect the woodland in kind of any negative way. That's the point I'm trying to make. They're dead already um yeah, you could argue there's a little bit of deadwood benefit, but eventually this crop will be harvested and these little little sticks will get uh, smashed down and driven over to keep the machines afloat. So again, there's not really any need to worry about what I'm cutting down for firewood. It's, it's pretty wet in here, there's a lot of moisture dripping down, so I don't think I'm going to film too much in here, but I'll get cut some firewood and then I'll bring you back when I'm setting up the fire and getting some coffee on. Right, I got some firewood. Everything is just completely soaking um, at this time of year, especially in the Highlands, especially the West Highlands. Never mind with weather like this. Um, I grabbed some birch bark, but it's just yeah, it's not good because of the the moisture in Scotland, and uh, you know we're quite far north. The birch bark tends to grow quite thick. Um, and you don't get that kind of papery bark that you see in Canada or Scandinavia or even further south in the UK you know it really is like paper but here it's just kind of this thick stuff that's very hard to work with and even when it comes off the tree it's just it just starts to go to nothing so quickly so it's very hard to find a nice piece of birch bark to scrape and light um, so I'm basically just going to make some 
rough feather sticks with this spruce and hopefully um, hopefully that's enough nope Yeah, the trick in this weather is uh, even though you're keen to get the fire started and you know get warm and dry, it's you kind of have to take your time. Don't smother it; just let it do what it's going to do. I mean, even now, I think it's actually going to burn out because these twigs are too too wet. Yeah, it is. So I'll have to try this again and uh, hopefully get it going soon. Right, I think we got there in the end. I just did a few more feather sticks and built it up a bit more slowly. As you can see, it probably looks like a big kind of raised nest, but I'm just trying to keep the, the airflow in there and not smother it. I'll show you this grill quickly. So yeah, it's Bitty Big Q. Stainless steel comes with that size so it's about the size of my hand and it just folds out into a grill. It's got foldable legs you can adjust the height if you want. I'm going to keep it low because I want to boil some water. Yeah they fold out like that and then if you want to it gets even bigger. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And yeah, I'll just put that over the fire uh, and get some coffee on. Right guys, that is just coming up half past four. All the firewood prep is done. I've split a load of stuff and I've also got some sort of whole rounds as well that'll burn a bit slower later on. Should have enough. It's feeling quite mild at the moment. I've just taken a couple layers off after doing all the, the firewood. And actually, in front of this rock and with the tarp, Kind of trapping the heat it's it's very warm under here so it's quite nice but yeah i put the fire back on uh, to make a hot drink i'll probably just keep it going now through the evening but that's that's it really I don't really have much else to to do apart from settle in for the evening um, in terms of dinner i've got a mix of things i've got some chicken chorizo Mushrooms, chopped tomatoes. Just gonna fry all that up together. I'll just cook it on the grill here, which I'm I'm quite liking. 
Yeah, I'll probably just sit here and chill for a little bit um, before dinner. Just keep drying out the clothes. And uh, yeah, look forward to this evening. I forgot my spork, so I'm making the world's worst looking spoon slash spatula in five minutes. Look at that. That is the level of bushcraft you get on this channel. Rough as. As long as I've got something to move things around in the pan, that's all I really care about. Alright guys, it's uh, pretty much 6 o'clock, still light enough to, to walk around, which is nice, really starting to feel the, the days stretch out now, as we get to the end of February, but uh, yeah, I'll get the pan on here, get some, get some oil in, get it nice and hot, and then I've got, I'll put the chicken in first, it's been marinating in uh, Worcester sauce and um, pureed ginger for the last 24 hours, so hopefully that'll uh, add some nice flavour too. I've just added in some mixed herbs and a bit of smoked paprika. Definitely smells good. I think that's done. Smells good anyway. Let's try some. Good. It's quite sweet with the, the Worcester sauce, it's nice. Mm. <sighs> I've got a wee dram with me, as always. Um, it's actually the last of my Laphroaig. It's only a couple of mouthfuls in here, but oh, so good. Right, I am just going to eat this probably quite slowly with my DIY spatula. And uh, I'll bring you back later on when I've finished.
Right folks, that is 10 o'clock. I'm in my sleeping bag. I'm just going to uh, lie down by the fire and watch it go out. And then I can go to sleep without worrying about it. But yeah, it's been a really, really nice evening. Very comfortable in front of the fire. Like I said earlier, nice and still, no wind, no rain up until this point. So, um, yeah, end of the day ended up being quite pleasant, to be honest. But yeah, I think that's me for tonight. Um, I've got some good stuff for breakfast. I've got black pudding square sausage and some bacon and I'll have some coffee as well we'll see um, we'll see what the weather does with the amount of rain I was expecting it to be a bit more windy and unsettled but yeah it's really still and the sky is quite clear at the moment so we'll see everything's under the tarp anyway so if it does start raining we're well sheltered but uh, yeah, I'll leave it there and I'll see you in the morning. Morning folks, it's just past 7 o'clock, slept pretty well, I um, I didn't bother with my inflatable mat last night, um, I decided to just go with a thin like foldable sleeping pad because I, I see people sleeping on them all the time without an inflatable and I think how can they do it? It can't be that comfortable. But it was actually all right. Uh, Temperature-wise, I didn't really notice a difference. Um, obviously, you need to be a little bit careful about what ground you're on. It's quite soft here, so I think that helped, obviously. But yeah, it's about three or four degrees this morning. The heavy rain didn't come last night, but there's kind of light drizzle at the moment so I think it's just going to get heavier but yeah I just got the, the fire on and um, getting some coffee Go on then.
Alright guys, it's uh, 9 o'clock now. The rain is steadily getting heavier and the, the wind's picking up a little bit so I'm not going to hang around until it gets worse. Uh, I've just been letting this fire die down as much as possible which if you watched my last video and I was talking about leave no trace uh, this is all part of it you know you don't just don't just let the fire burn out and that's it you know you leave the charred remain try and burn it down as small as possible and then you've got less to deal with like I should have maybe a few small embers and that's it I'll put plenty of water on check there's no residual heat left in the ground and then put all the soil and vegetation back on and try and leave it as close to as how I found it it's almost impossible when you're doing this kind of thing to leave absolutely nothing at all but um, if you get as close as you can and these things grow back in fairly quickly but yeah I'll, I'll finish the fire off I'll finish getting packed up and if you want to stick around for Forest Thoughts, I've got a, a very important report to tell you about that came out in the last couple of weeks um, relating to our Caledonian Pinewood remnants. So if you stick around, I'll see you in a couple of minutes. But if not, I will see you on the next one. Hi folks, thanks for sticking around again for Forest Thoughts. I'd, I'd like to start off this one on more of a, a positive note and just talk a little bit about what's happening in Scotland at the moment in terms of um, land management. There's a lot going on and Although on the ground, you know, physical progress is almost glacial and there's so much work still to do, so much work, like, unbelievable amount of work, but I would say at the moment the pressure for change and the recognition of what needs to change is probably better than it's ever been. We've got land reform stuff going on at the moment, uh, changes to deer management legislation, the peatland restoration stuff is flying at the moment, there's lots of money being uh, thrown at that, um, pressure on you know grouse estates and sporting estates in terms of muir burn, you know, flood prevention, restoring woodlands, unnaturally high deer populations, all this stuff, it's, there's like a bow wave of pressure just building and building and building. And we're already starting to see some changes come out of that. I, I think the Scottish government recognises the problems and that we have to do something about it. There may be just not taking enough action yet to do something about it. I I attended the Nature Friendly Farming uh, webinar or a webinar um, last week, which was very interesting. It was talking about nature friendly farming in Scotland specifically, and they actually recorded the whole thing and uh, put it on YouTube. I'll put a link to the video. And uh, that was interesting. Again, there's a lot of consultation going on at the moment about how farming is um, measured in terms of its environmental benefits and how people are paid for that. Um, you know, it's all part of the consultation after um, you know leaving 
the EU and the CAP payments and uh, there's a series of events and you know consultations and all that information is being fed back into the government and it's not something I know a huge amount about uh, so I would say it's worth going and listening even for the first half hour section um, where they sort of introduce the webinar and, and what's going on in Scotland uh, Basically, the, the sort of environmental farming, the smaller scale farming, is a much more established thing in Europe, but it's not really recognised in Scotland and the wider UK. People have always been rewarded for high levels of production, but we can see that that's, um, that's not always beneficial, especially in these more fragile upland environments. So yeah, we'll go and check that out. And also, there's a big push at the moment for um, Atlantic Rainforest. Now what is Atlantic Rainforest? Well, basically down the west coast of Scotland uh, naturally there would have been a sort of temperate rainforest, uh, very wet, lots of broadleaves, even areas of uh, Scots pine as well. Quite a unique habitat to the west coast of Scotland and other areas like Wales. Um, and again the recognition of that's increasing and to help publicize it they're calling it Atlantic Rainforest. Now <laughs> I think uh, there's a little bit of uh, Highland Tiger in there if you remember that one when they were pushing the wildcat uh, stuff it was called the Highland Tiger to attract attention. So, Similar thing, Atlantic Rainforest sounds a bit better than uh, maybe Atlantic Oak Wood, something like that. But the important thing is awareness is growing and there's lots of money being thrown at that in the moment too. So there's, there's lots of positives and that kind of leads me on to the main thing I wanted to talk about and I think it's, it's very timely with everything else going on and that is the Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project. Now, this is a project that was initiated by Trees for Life and it's been funded by several different organizations and donors from charities to government organizations. And it's a four year project or it was a four year project and the report came out recently I'll put the link to the page and the report so you can read it yourself. But it's basically a report on the, the health and status of our existing Caledonian Pinewood remnants. But before I talk about that, I want to take you back a little bit, first of all, to 1959 and um, some research was published by Stephen and Carlisle uh, called the Native Pinewoods of Scotland and they had basically carried out um, extensive research into genuine sort of surviving ancient Caledonian Pinewood remnants and they mapped them and surveyed their condition and all these kind of things and they, I've got it written here, there's 35 surviving remnants of ancient boreal pinewood, they call it, and this was classed as only pinewoods directly descended from one generation to another by natural means since natural colonisation after the Ice Age. These were the only areas that qualified, so planted areas and all this kind of stuff um, didn't count. And this report really set a, a baseline for what we now recognize as very important ancient Caledonian pine wood. And I would say that the, the book they published, I, I would love to have a copy, I can't find a copy, they become quite rare. If you find a first edition copy, then they're very valuable too, worth a lot of money. Anyway, as time went on, there was increasing concern in the 70s that these pine woods were still under threat and we weren't really managing them or improving them. And this theme kind of carried on 
and in the 90s the Forestry Commission did a lot of work and they came up with the core Pinewood inventory that updated and kind of built on previous reports like Stephen and Carlisle. This report and the research has been done as part of the uh, Caledonian Pinewood Recovery Project is really the first extensive in-depth look we've had since the 90s really and long story short it's it's not good it's not good news which I don't think is a surprise to to many of us who have an interest in this um, some areas are doing well, like the, the big areas in, in the Cairngorm, Cairngorm Connect project, they've, they've got the kind of scale, the money, the focus, the, the, the joined upness. But for the majority of remnants uh, throughout Scotland, they're, they're very small, they're very fra fragile, very disconnected, um, overgrazed. You know, they just don't have that kind of resilience and they're, they're just dwindling and disappearing. So, yeah, the, in summary, the findings are, and I, like I said, I'll link to the report. It's, it's well worth reading the full report. I'm just giving a very brief summary here, but uh, the majority of Pinewood remnants are extremely fragile. Just uh, a few trees in some places. If you watch my video where I went and found uh, the small Pinewood remnant up near Alapool, then you understand what we're dealing with here. Um, there's no regeneration coming in because the, the deer pressure is so high, any seedlings are getting browsed. So if there's no recruitment of seedlings, you've basically just got a few old trees that are slowly dying and disappearing and that is happening in places. Areas that have been fenced there's maybe a little bit of regeneration, but of course that regeneration can only go as far as the fence. Fences are expensive and you know difficult to put into some of these areas. So you know the bigger the fence, the more expensive it is. So a lot of these pinewoods are maybe just ring fenced just to enclose them, so they don't have any room to expand. Fences aren't foolproof either. They're they're a necessary evil in some places, but without maintenance, they're almost certainly going to get breached by deer at some point. And if no one's acti actually actively managing these areas, then there could be deer in there for months, years, and no one's really paying attention. A lot of these little pinewood remnants historically haven't really been important to a lot of these kind of sort of private estates. It's maybe just an awkward corner that. There's, it's not really good for anything else, so they're not really invested in, you know, actually looking at what's going on in these pinewood remnants, and they're slowly just disappearing and dying. Um, Non-native conifer species are also a threat. Historically, we have even underplanted um, mature Scots pine with Sitka spruce and other non-native conifers. At the time, the thought was to, to maximise the sort of maximise the woodland by you know put, planting young trees underneath and then you know all coming up. But actually, uh, these non-native conifers just uh, kind of overshadow the Scots pine. Scots pine is a light demander. You know they they need light. Uh, any sort of non-native regen is just smothering any native regen and eventually it just swamps out the out the woodland and that's happened in a surprising amount of areas too another part is connectivity like i say a lot of these pinewood remnants are miles away from any existing forest in general never mind other caledonian pinewood remnants so that makes them very fragile because these small areas can just get wiped out so easy. You know, they've got nothing, nothing to connect to. You know, the the wildlife and the plants and everything else that holds. You know, they've got no. There's no robustness there for kind of 
continuation and to sort of connect up, you know, they're very isolated and uh, yeah, in a very weak position. I could talk about this report for about an hour and <laughs> still keep going. I think it's best if I just stop there and like I say, I'll put a link in the description and if you really want to read it, you can go and read it. I, I would recommend you do if, if you're interested in this. But I think that's it for this video. You can probably hear that the wind and the rain is steadily getting worse and worse. So I just need to pack up this tarp, stick it in the bag and, and then I can go. But thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you on the next one.